Hello and welcome to another edition of Tunnel Vision, a show brought to you by uscfootball.com. I'm Keely, you're joined by Ryan Abraham and Shotgun Spratling. We have a fun show for you guys today. The offseason is in full swing. USC is kind of in Camp Palooza right now. We're at the tail end of it. Uh, they had a 7-on-7 camp, a uh, passing tournament, if you will, a Rising Stars camp, two elite camps. Shotgun and I just came from USC's second elite camp today. Uh, and they also have another 7-on-7 passing tournament this Saturday. So a lot of camps, a lot of things are happening, as well as player-run practices. USC brought back PRP, so they're conditioning, they're they're throwing it around. A lot of things are happening. It's June. USC football is just around the corner. Uh, but if you guys want to contact us in the show, you can tweet at us and put your hashtag tunnel vision. I will see it and put it on the screen. You can also call us at 512-4-TUNNEL. And you can also, wherever you're watching this, YouTube Live, Facebook, uh, and Periscope, you can put your comment, question, and concern. We will read it and answer it. Fun stuff. Uh, before we get into that, Ryan, I believe you have an event that you would like the people to know about. Yeah, next Tuesday. First of all, I'm all dressed up here today. I was like, you know, I don't usually you know, just put maybe some polo on or sometime. But then you kind of notice, like, Shaka, well, he's wearing a hat, but he's also wearing a tie all the time. So, uh, <laughs> I just kind of noticed Balances that, but it out. I did. I did get uh, Manny Petty today, so my nails are pretty. So yeah, this is the guy close. who said, "Oh, I can't come to the camp today," and here he is getting I went, a you know, Manny got Petty. Got some ice cream. Got a Manny Petty. I, I did do stuff. a podcast earlier with Harvey Hyde, oh, so we did that. Poor but thing. yeah, so call, on Tuesday, so you guys know Jake Olson, uh, former USC long snapper, just happens to be blind. His new company, Engage. You can go at Let's Engage uh, on the social media stuff and check it out. But uh, it's going to be a really cool event Tuesday at the Lab, right across from USC. Uh, I believe it starts at 7 o'clock, but you can we, all the information's up there on the social media channels. But uh, Matt Barkley, former USC quarterback, will be one of the featured speakers. Jake Olson himself, uh, who's awesome. He's, if you've never seen him speak live, he is great. And John Baxter, USC special team coach. Uh, they'll all be there. I'll be the MC for the evening. They're going to have uh, sponsored stuff from Travis Matthew, get some gear and stuff for people that are there. So it should be really fun. I love the Travis Matthew stuff, by the way. So really fun uh, event. Hope to guys see you at the lab. It'll be a chance to talk some USC football. If you got some memories of Matt Barkley, you can you know sign your whatever you know, your T-shirt or something, whatever you got. So it's uh, it's cool. I think I forget where Matt's now. Is he in uh, Buffalo? Maybe or he's you know in Buffalo. Where, he's in Buffalo. Yes. Yeah. So uh, this is kind of the off time that they did their off season workouts or whatever their OTAs, and now they're they're they got some off time before they go back for the camp stuff. So it should be cool. So Tuesday night, make sure you check it out. We'll, we have information up on. USCfootball.com or follow any of the social media stuff. You can see it. Fun stuff. Make sure you check that out. Yeah. Uh, but like I said, it is camp season at USC. Uh, we just came from the elite camp. Uh, Ryan, you were at the first elite camp. Mm -hmm. Shotgun, you were at both elite camps. What did you guys take away uh, from those two days? Well, they were elite, which is good. So, uh, they used to, the Rising Stars camp used to be the elite camp, and now it's sort of like a big free-for-all camp. And so to, to have like 60 guys, I don't know how many people were there today, but the first camp last week was about it's 60. Like 150 today, so a little bit bigger oh, today. Oh, so it was a bigger one. Yeah, today. it was. Okay. I don't know if uh, it was that many. That's what Gerard said. Anyway, and I always trust really. Gerard. But, you know, when you have a smaller number like that, it's good and you can kind of, you know, point things out. And a lot of offers, uh, you know, maybe last week, but today a ton of offers and more 2021 kids, guys getting their first ever D1 offer of uh, being from USC. So it's a little shift in recruiting like strategy maybe they're getting out there ahead of some of this stuff and a bunch of offensive linemen uh picking up some commitments and stuff so yeah i, th I thought it was interesting and they're trying to use some of this positive moment momentum that's going on right now in the offseason you got to build off you got to go away from the five and seven kind of build off what's going on chris Steele, brubacoy uh having bryce young as the you know the five-star quarterback committed they kind of build on that stuff in the recruiting process one of the things i noticed is that there was not as much uh out-of-state talent you know, oh, yeah. you, you look back a couple of years, you look at Alex Leatherwood coming or Jackson Carmen coming to the camp, and that's what happens when you go five and seven. You, you're not going to be able to attract the out-of-state talent the same way. So the important thing for USC to do this summer, both of these camps, the Rising Stars camps, the 707, is to evaluate local talent and to, to find out who are the guys that are going to fit in this new system. And I think that's the biggest thing is you're seeing some of the offensive line offers, whether it was Joey Wright last week committing uh, or some of the offers that have gone out today, you know, looking at the sizes of these guys, a lot of tall 
you know, yeah. not as heavy. You know, you don't see the Damian Mamas or the Vianney Telemann Navajos uh, or even Toa Lobanon. Those guys are all, you know, in the six foot to six foot three range. You're looking at guys that are six, 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 eight. You're looking for the big old boys yeah. as far as height, but not the big old boys as far as girth, I, I, I would say. Um, so I think that you're seeing a transition of recruiting there. And then that might be why you see some of these are, you know, a couple of these offensive linemen, it's their first offers. Yeah. Maybe it's because, you know, Guys that are 240 pounds right now, other teams might be taking a wait and see approach. Whereas USC, that's what they're looking for. They're looking for the tall, you know, the agile guys more than the big, uh, you know, super large guys as far as girth. The, you know, the jet to they're more difficult to run around as far as you know getting by them with their with their weight and their strength. Now you, it's going to be using your arm length and, and getting around people that way that you're trying to trying to slow people down. Yeah, you see some of that in the air raid offense more. Where kind of you got to get around these guys. It's not. It's less about. You know, kind of plowing forward and just like you know, steamrolling people. It's more about, hey man, you got to get around the six, seven uh, offensive tackle. Who's the guy that just went, uh, you know, in the first round from Washington State? I forget his name, but you know, the kind of guys like that. He's someone that wasn't as highly ranked coming out of high school and develops, and, and you can see him uh, project that way in the pros. But definitely a shift uh, in what they were doing, and you know, it's I think it's uh, it's it's good. I think just trying to take control where. You feel like last year when things sort of spiraled out of control as far as the season goes, there was a lot of late offers trying to like make up for, for lost time. And it seems like this is more of like, hey, kind of you know laying the groundwork early. And not that all these kids are going to be you know committable offers are going to you know still be around later on, but just in case you got these guys kind of uh, er, uh, get them on get in on them early, and then you kind of see how everything develops going forward, especially the 2021 guys because that's forever from now. <laughs> forever from now, <laughs> forever year and a half. half. A year and a half away from when right. they could sign. But a lot can happen between now and then. Uh, going back to the offensive lineman from Washington State was Andre Dillard. Yeah. You know, he was the 22nd overall pick, I believe. You know, Coming out of high school, he was 6'5", 240. Yeah. You know, I just looked up his, uh, his recruiting profile to see. And that's what USC is looking for more than you know the guys that are 6'2 and 300 pounds. They're looking for guys that can grow a little bit while they're at USC, but have that, that wingspan, have that ability to be roadblocks on the edges. They're tough to get around because of how long and length lengthy they are uh, rather than just being because they're, they're big chubby guys. Yeah. See, since you guys are referencing them so much, let me just get into the commitments that USC picked up oh. in the last week. So uh, one of the guys uh, Shotgun is referencing is Joey Wright. He's a 2023 star offensive tackle. He's 6'6", two, 297. Uh, he committed at 12, 17 a.m., which is interesting commitment time. And then there's also Kyle Jurgens, a 2023 uh, star offensive defensive lineman. USC saw him as both in the league camp. Uh, Gerard Martinez believes they're going more towards the defensive line with Kyle, uh, but it's kind of TBD right now. Uh, he's 6'4 and a half, 241. Um, so that's the two kind of linemen commits. And then USC also got a commit from uh, Veltre Jefferson, a 2021 three-star wide receiver. He's 6'4 and 195, someone that you guys kind of recognize uh, when he showed up to elite camp. Yeah, he so he was going with the tight end group, really. Like, there wasn't a big uh, wide receiver group, and I was up on top of Dado shooting all the wide receivers, and there was a lot of good, you know, a lot of guys, um, you know, like the, the Tayshawn Holdens and stuff that we were, you know, that you know USC's after. He's the Alabama commit to transfer to Narbonne. I just put up highlights of him, by the way, if you want to check that out. But we were, I was trying to shoot everybody in the line. Was hoping to pick up Beltre Jefferson, but he was actually running mostly with the tight ends, and I wasn't really shooting them. He came through the receivers line for like I got like three clips of him, unfortunately, but we didn't know too much about him. He came down from Fresno, uh, got an offer, committed uh, on Twitter and stuff right there. But uh, we, yeah, there's there's just a lot going on. Even though there was not that many people, there's a lot kind of going on there. And you, some guy comes from out of nowhere that you don't really know much about, uh, coming down from Central Valley in Fresno, and ends up getting offered and like. Uh, announcing his commitment on Twitter that evening. Yeah, and it's, he was a guy that we just saw. And we're like, that guy looks like a dude. Yeah. Don't know who he is necessarily. Six foot four, you know, yeah. Yeah, which is like, that guy looks good. We're going to watch him today and see. And, you know, he stood out. He stood out as a guy that has the body. And, you know, we find out later he was, he's a wide receiver listed right now. The question then becomes if he sticks with you, his USC commitment, does he become a tight end at a future date? Or, can you know, can he stay at the weight he is and, uh, you know, kind of, 
be a physical outside presence at the same time at the receiver position. So with Veltre Jefferson, you know, you never know who's going to show up in one of these camps. We don't have a list beforehand like, okay, this is the exact invite yeah. list it's going to be. And even then you still wouldn't know because – Sometimes the guys you expect to come, you know, we'll we'll talk to prospects and they're like, yeah, I'm I'm going to that USC elite camp, and, and then they don't, go. they don't make it. You know, you catch the flu, or someone comes or they and they catch you a didn't nap, expect. you yeah, know, yeah. whatever it is. Uh, but yeah, you know, sometimes somebody shows up and like I, I didn't think that guy was going to be there, and you know, they do show up. So you don't really know at these camps until you see them on campus. And you know, we were able to see some of those kids, and Veltre Jefferson was a guy that stood out immediately, and we eventually found out who he was and found out he got an offer, and then he had he had committed it that evening. Nice. Um. We'll ha we have a lot of questions about the camps and whatnot. We'll get into that in a bit. Just before we dive into questions, I want to talk about USC's player run practices. They've had three so far. Uh, it's a little different this year. We can't see as much. Uh, they close it if it's on Howard Jones Field. We can't take photos or video if it happens on Howard Jones Field. If it's on Cromwell, we can, but mm -hmm. they haven't had anything on Cromwell yet. It's been locked. Um, so we've kind of observed what's happening in and out of the gates, but also trying getting a, a vantage point around Howard Jones Field. Uh, shotgun. Uh, you were there. I was there. What did you see uh, from PRP so far? I mean, I, I think the things that, that stood out is just the players' comments when they're leaving the, the field. And we're not allowed to talk to them. We're not allowed to interview them right now. Next month, we will get a chance to. Um, but right now, you know, it's just seeing their interactions with each other as they leave the field. We're taking some photos and stuff. But, uh, you know, once they, they exit the gates... But listen to like a guy like Jordan Iasefa, you know, a, a senior that's that's been around for for what seems like forever now. But listen to him come out and just being like, "That was the hardest workout I've ever had," and saying, "I've I've never died so many times." I believe it was the quote. <laughs> I've never died so hard. So hard. <laughs> yeah. Well, Keely's already got that. doesn't like it called workout. He's hashtag strength training. Strength so. training, guys. But, you know. Well, when you're on the field, you're not strength training right. when you're conditioning and stuff. So I it is know. a workout. He it is a summer me. workout. I think he messaged all of us. <laughs> and there was some reference to not saying workout and saying hashtag strength training. I think to I all of us. I said conditioning in my tweet, and he still replied with hashtag strength yeah. training. So I said something about workout. He said hashtag strength training. So, I, you know, that's, that's. Well, until I can see exactly what they're doing, I'm calling it a workout. <laughs> okay. If they want to invite us in, hey, hey. then we'll call it a strength training. All right. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's a good negotiation. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, I put a couple pictures in there, Keely, if you want to. Um, oh, for, yes. I shall summer. put that in. Um, Just from the, the, uh, the PR, you know, after the PRP. So uh, we, we're not be able to watch them, like Shotgun said, but coming in and out, you can take pictures of them. And it's funny because the players love when we take pictures. They'll pose. They'll do all kinds of cool stuff. They'll ask, hey, can you take a picture of the group of us? And uh, so it's weird. Like, you know, they, it's something that always see, and they always want to see the video. If we're shooting highlights and someone makes a nice catch, they want to come over like, Keely, can I see that and stuff? Uh, so it kind of it kind of sucks that we're not able to do that anymore, and it's it's great. I mean, we had even guys like Daniel Jeremiah from the NFL Network would be like, "Oh, I love watching your summer workout stuff because it's like another way he can like evaluate these college players going into the NFL." Uh, so maybe that rules will change, but but they've been kind of getting more and more restrictive as we go, and this is the most restrictive we've we've been yeah been for us. The the one interesting thing and the probably the most notable thing from you know seeing the guys coming in and out and, and seeing the guys that have worked out uh, is that you see who's back from injuries mm -hmm. and guys like C.J. Pollard's back, Elijah Griffin with his, his shoulder injury is back doing stuff. You know, don't know how much these guys are necessarily doing, but the fact that they are. You know, in a T-shirt that is drenched in sweat, tells you that they are active out there. Yes. I don't, you don't know exactly. Well, Elijah Griffin, you they know, weren't I, swimming or anything. I'm, right. as, I'm assuming that he's able to do everything on the field that they're doing with a shoulder injury. But seeing guys like C.J. Pollard, you know, who had a an ankle injury, then you know, you know that he is back healthy if he's fully yeah. working out with them like that. So I, I think seeing those guys. I mean, there's some other guys on that list. Talano Hufunga is, is a big one. You know, seeing him back out there, you know, as a, as a full participant, it seems like. Uh, so, you know, seeing the guys out there and seeing who's healthy, I think, is, is probably the most notable thing that we've seen from this, as, as well as just the comments and stuff. And you can tell that they're, these workouts are different. Yeah. Yep. These hashtag strength training programs <laughs> yeah. are different. Yeah. The Talanoa Hufunga one, we kind of heard there could be some issues there, you know, having the collarbone broken twice. But like what you guys said, we saw him out there, it seemed like he was fine. Still no, like, cleats for uh, Solomon Tuialapupu, which yep. is, you know, that's a little concerning. A lot of the fans on the Peristyle, USC fans, they want to see him. They want to see the 255 pound, whatever, two foot, 250 pound middle linebacker guy get out there on the field and just start wreaking havoc. Him and, and Pallier Neoteote, who I did a story on today, you can check that out on uscfootball.com, said he's going to be the big household name after the season. So that was my pick. Uh, but, you know, seeing guys like that, 
not seeing him uh, in cleats yet may be a little concerning. We'll see how he yeah. progresses through the summer. Yeah. It's, it's the same concern that we had last summer. Yeah. But I think it, it increases now that it's been a year, essentially, for Solomon. Yeah. He was at, so I covered him at the uh, Polynesian Bowl out in, in Hawaii, like, I guess two years, was it two years ago now or a year and a half ago or whatever now? And, and we weren't sure if he was going to go. He was in a, a little boot and kind of hanging out there. So he went to Hawaii, which is smart for him, uh, but wasn't able to participate. And the same sort of thing. It's just always been like, oh, is he going to be able to go? Is he going to be able to go? And so far, you know, he, he went for like two practices, I think, in spring. Yeah. And then they kind of shut him down. So it was good he was out there. And he made plays when he was out there. So he, he's... I, I think he wants to be out there. We'll see if he can be. Yeah, we've also seen some new faces at PRPs as well. We saw the fall entrance. Uh, we saw Drew Richmond, uh, the Duco transfer, or not Duco, the, just the transfer. Uh, and then we also saw uh, Chris Steele and Brew McCoy. Brew McCoy, we hear, is sick, so he hasn't showed up to a PRP yet, but we did see Chris Steele on Tuesday. Yeah, you saw Chris Steele. You saw Kenny Kristen for the first time. You saw Drake London for the first time uh, yesterday. So seeing those, those young guys are getting out there, they're getting our opportunities, uh, it, you know, just seeing that there's more bodies there for some yeah. of those positions. You know, Britton Allen's not the only DB anymore. Adonis Oti is, is out there uh, with Chris Steele being out there. Chris Steele getting some first-team reps already, you know, just getting mixed in there. Jaden Williams is there. So you know, the, the depth at the DB position has kind of exploded. You know, you get Elijah Griffin back. You know, Greg Johnson's healthy now. You got C.J. Pollard. You got Talanoa Hufunga. Now you add all these freshmen in there. Trey Davis is on campus. We haven't seen him work out yet, but he's on campus as well. So, you know, I think that the, the DB, it's a, a huge boost for them to have all these extra bodies that coming in there. C.B. Nomura as well, if he plays, you know, depending on where they line him up as linebacker or safety, you know, he's a kind of a hybrid guy. But Carolina Makala is also there. So all these names are just being added to the mix that they're finally going to get to actually practice in the fall. Yeah. You know, they're going to get to do some one-on-ones <laughs> instead of, all right, we got five guys that can do these. We'll do a couple reps yeah. and then everybody take a break because we're hard tired. You yeah. four healthy receivers and three healthy defensive backs. What can we do? You know, so <laughs> that, that, that's the thing that was happening. Uh, that's the wait, best combo. I know you guys haven't seen Matt Fink out there. He put on his Instagram, uh, he had surgery, uh, looked like some kind of knee surgery. I don't know if you guys heard anything about that, but he's – he was in the transfer portal, came back, said he's coming back to USC, but needed some sort of surgery. He was he was on campus on last Friday for their their workout. Uh, he was in the background on one of my photos, uh, but I didn't get a good photo of him himself. But so he's doing some stuff, and the way that well, well he missed Tuesday. Um, yeah. And then posted that. And he said he'll be back by fall camp. So it makes you wonder, he might be out for all the rest of PRPs. Not well, sure. I would guess. Yeah. If you're... The way you guys have made it sound, I've not seen the social media post itself, but it, it sounds like a minor surgery, like a yeah, scope or something scope to clean or something, something up. Yeah. Uh, so try to, to make sure that you're ready for the season itself. So it doesn't sound too serious to me. Yes. Yeah. Uh, let's jump into questions, but before we do, we actually have a caller. Oh, uh, let's do the caller. Yeah, let's go to a call from James in Huntington Beach. Hello, James. You are hey. on Tunnel Vision. Yeah, I just, I've been watching a lot of uh, Bruce McCoy and, I'm oh, sorry, not Bruce McCoy, Bryce Young. And I, I uh, my question is for next year when he comes in, uh, are they just going to give whoever the starter is this year? Do you think they're going to they're they're just going to run with that guy, or they're going to run in with because like I said, he has a tendency to run more than uh, J T Daniels, and I've been watching him, and he looks like he's on it. Hey as James, as far as being able to. James, yeah. I love that you're worried about uh, what's going to happen in 2020 uh, when Bryce Young comes <laughs> in and stuff. It's like it's so much can change between now and then. It's really hard to say. We don't even know who's going to start this year. I mean, we assume it's going to be JT Daniels. Um, you don't know what's going to happen with the athletic department, the coaching staff. I mean, a lot of changes could happen uh, between now and then. Uh -huh. But you know, it wouldn't be uncommon for a guy like Bryce Young to come in and redshirt if, to say, JT Daniels is the starter. He would get one more year and – you kind of like, you know, learn under him a little bit and kind of move on from there. And maybe the offense does change a little bit. I, you know, if it's still Graham Harrell and, uh, you know, he would use incorporate more of the, the athletic ability that a Bryce Young would have, he could certainly do that. But, man, that's, that's far away. It, it is. But the thing you look at with that is that he'll come in and he'll compete. You know, yeah. you expect him to be a guy that's going to come in and compete. He's going to probably have to get stronger for one. Uh, you know, even he's a, he has a slight build. You know, even at the height he has, he still has to get stronger. Yeah. I mean, he, he's never going to be a huge guy, but you still got to get stronger. Hashtag so strength you, training. So you can take <laughs> some of those hits because 
even though he plays in the Trinity League and there's a lot of big dudes in that league and there's a lot of, you know, uh, big-time athletes, it's still not the same as college ball. You know, the guy, everyone is bigger. Everyone is stronger. So you take a couple of those hits while you're running, and it's kind of the Michael Vick situation where, you know, when he was in the NFL, it's like, do we really want him to run that much? He's so electric, but when he does, there's the injury risk. You know, that's something I think Bryce Young will have to learn a little bit. Now, he's more of a pocket passer than a run-first guy, um, and I think he would add a different element to that offense. And you've seen with the air raid offense, the, when the, that air raid offense has been the most dynamic has been when there's been a mobile quarterback. Yeah. The Baker Mayfields and Kyler Patrick, Murray and, Patrick yeah. Mahomes, you know, those guys that, that don't necessarily have to run. You know, they can stick in the pocket and they can make the throws that you want. And, you know, the best are the guys that, that are super accurate and make the throws. But then if things break down, then you can do still do something. And it's really demoralizing on the defense when the guy takes up oh, yeah. for a 40 yeah. yard run or something. Like, oh, man, like everyone's covered. Like, oh, then the quarterback just runs. And yeah. And, and I think when Bryce Young, you know, if he eventually becomes the USC quarterback, I think you'll open things up a little bit. I don't think you'll, if, if it's still the air raid office, I don't think you'll change a lot. As far as, all right, we're going to run some more zone option you know, type stuff. I don't think that'll necessarily happen. I just think you'll have a different element when things break down. Now, hopefully things don't break down all the time like they have in the last couple of years in the <laughs> offensive line. You, you hope that's not the case. But if, they do, if, you know, if there is a breakdown, he's a guy that can you know, save your tackle, save a sack on the tackle. You know, suddenly, you know, when you look up and you got Kyler Murray, you're like, wow. You know, those tackles never give up any sacks. It was like, well, because he avoids everyone. So, no one, get, you know, it doesn't matter if someone gets by them. It's okay. Yeah. Uh, but I think that that's a long way down the road. And whoever wins the job this year is going to be here likely for two years. Yeah. You know, so, you know, they're going to be the starter for two years, you would expect, barring injury or anything. You expect if they win and have a little success, they're going to be the, the, the head guy for the next couple of, couple of years. Yeah. Yep. Thanks for the call, James. Yeah, thanks, James, for the call. And let's go to a question from One Blue Love Twenty Three. He says, "By when will USC know if Brim McCoy and Chris Steele will be eligible to play for next season?" Te yeah, technically they won't until uh, the decision's made. Yeah, they have to. So they have to file the appeal kind of thing. There's paperwork that needs to be signed, and uh, you know, I, I seems like that's in the process of happening. And like we said, it seems like for Brew McCoy, much less likely to happen than Chris Steele. Much more likely to happen, um, but I don't know. It just depends when they're filing everything, and they might not be in a hurry. Like, do you really need to know? Um, you know, much before fall camp, we might not know until August or something. I mean, I think you want to know as soon as you can. Yeah. So then you can, you know, can make the plans for the year. Okay. Well, if you're sitting out, this is the the game plan we have for you. Versus if you're eligible, okay, when do we use you? You know, are you going to redshirt? Are you going to, you know, are you going to play four games in redshirt? Are you going to play the entire year? Are we going to use you on spec? So I think it, it changes a lot of things. So if you get it, find out earlier, you can make those plans earlier, just exactly what you're going to do with someone. Hey, we want you to bulk up 30 pounds or whatever. So, you know, you're not getting somebody game ready. You know, you're focusing right, on, yeah. you know, the bulking up or whatever, may, you know, whatever, you know, change they want to do there, that type of, of thing. So I think the earlier you can find out, the better. However, there is no deadline here as far as the NCAA saying, okay, we'll decide by this time. Yeah, you don't know. The NCAA just makes decisions, you know, when they want it to. It seemed to happen fairly quickly once you file. Like, they seem to come back. For, like, it's not been, like, months and stuff, but it just depends when it, USC No, it files. depends. You, there's been some guys, you know, it's a little bit different for his transfer, but some guys, they're looking for that, that extra year medical. Yeah, those, that, I think that takes a And they wait and wait and wait, and then suddenly it's like, well, we might find out before the first game. <laughs> yeah. Come on, NCAA, make a decision here. For the transfer stuff, it seemed to be happening quickly. And it uh, always causes controversy because you know some guy with a great ex you know great reason doesn't you know get granted, and then some guy with a half-ass reason gets granted. So you're like, okay, whatever. That's the answer to play. You know that. Sometimes it's which lawyer argues yeah, better. Yeah, that's true. Uh, Raphael says, "Do you guys feel that there's something brewing this year as opposed to last? I believe SC is going to shock some folks out there this year. Just watch." Yeah, brewing. Did he mean like? Was uh, like, no, like it was spelled normally. Is it a play on on words? No, and I, I think we talked about this uh, on the Dan Weber, Keely Your podcast, and people ask like, you know, hey, where do you think USC is going to finish? I picked all the games. I came up with seven and five, uh, but you know, could this team go ten and two? I think realistically, the team could. You know, and I, I feel like it's going to score. You know, they'll score. They went. They were ninetieth in the country in scoring at twenty six point one points a game. Easily, I think you could score ten more points with this offense. Basically, the same personnel that would put you in the top twenty offenses in the country. We saw, you know, penalties getting addressed. We saw strength and conditioning getting addressed. A lot of things were, you know, a lot of the discipline problems. 
crypto, it could add up to all those things work. Yeah, you, and you see this team like beat all the teams they're supposed to beat, maybe lose like to Washington and Notre Dame or something. Like, I think that's realistic. I'm not ready to pull a trigger and say that's going to happen, but I can see a path to it. It's just, you know, some of the mistakes this team has made. You could see them stubbing their toe a couple of times and then, you know, and, and not finishing that high. But I, I could certainly see it happen. I think, you, I mean, you could be right, but I'm not ready to pull a trigger and say, yep, that's going to happen. Yeah, there's, there's still a lot of question marks with this team. You know, the DBs, the offense line, how the offense works now. There's a lot of questions still. But as we've said earlier in this offseason, things appear to be slowly working their way up the mountain again. Trending up, yeah. Yeah, so, you know, there's positive signs. How will those positive signs translate when you get on the field and somebody hits you in the mouth? We don't necessarily know <laughs> right, from this yeah, group. Yeah. You know, that's that's part of the whole culture thing, and especially, you know, the, the strength training and stuff and building that toughness in the yeah. offseason. You don't know how that translates necessarily until someone puts on the pads and you get hit. Yeah, and then that's you, true. Then you see, if you can see guys jump back up, you know, and, you know, in fall camp and stuff, and you're like, okay, maybe there is some a little bit more toughness with this group. How do they react as a team when something goes wrong? When you sack a guy in the end zone for a safety at Texas, and you're at Texas, and it doesn't get called a safety. <laughs> how does the team react? Yeah. Because several players said after that, that moment happened, they said, well, the game changed then. Well, there was a lot more game after that, but yeah, to yeah. them, that's when the game changed because they felt things were working against them. Then obviously a couple, I think it was a couple drives later, you get the block field goal and everything just, they just completely shut down. Yeah. I got an Instagram question if I want to read Oh, that an quick Instagram question. Yeah. Uh, Adam, he's, he's friends with our, our friend, uh, you know, Bald Brian from the Adam Corolla show. Brian, yeah. Um, so he, yeah, he, he messaged me on Instagram. I don't think he does some of the other social media things, but. Um, he said, I know the last couple of seasons, season openers have been tight games and games typically labeled as gimmies. Uh, the Alabama one, I don't think that was a gimme, but also including non-openers that were gimmies. But are we going to see some lights turning on and the potential for a more positive season if we completely dominate a tough Fresno State team in our first game? A season tone setter game, if you will. Uh, this situation would also help the depth in terms of getting others who need the experience or are we going to see another close one and major program changes to, at the end of the year? Thoughts? Thanks. That's from Adam. I think if USC dominates Fresno State, wins convincingly, I think you take that as a real big positive sign. Yeah. Um, that they have struggled, not just recently, they've struggled for a while in openers just because it's more of a trial period, it, it seems, is, is what some of the coaches have used it for, You know, whether it be Boston College or San Jose State or some of those games where you – you might win by like three touchdowns in some of those, but you're like, it still didn't, you know, you didn't feel, really feel like they, they dominated the game. If somehow USC does that at Fresno, you just go, whoa, we might, we might have to reevaluate this yeah. team as a whole. Um, will that happen? That's a, that's a much bigger yes. what if than, you know, how you react to it if they do dominate. I think, I think I understand what's going to happen if, if they dominate. You go, okay, this, this team might be for real. Yeah, I, th I think if they do dominate that, but that game, I, I mean, it might not get a lot of credit for it because it's Fresno State. But Fresno State did win 12 games last year, loses a lot of production. But just remember, Jeff Tedford took over when this team was 1-11, won 10 games. So he probably didn't take – you know, have that much uh, production to deal with, you know, when he came into the situation, turned it around right away. So I think he's a really good coach. I think he got this team to go from, you know, ten, from one win to 10 wins to 12 wins in three years. So yeah, you lose a bunch of guys. I'm not all that concerned that you lose some of that talent. I mean, I think he can replace that and, and coach him up. So I think a dominating win over Fresno State, maybe it doesn't, you know, turn as many heads as you would think, but I, I think it's, it would be really important. It would be a really good sign uh, you know, talking about it was what one blue true love or something was talking about. I think you know going forward is like yeah, if you can dominate Fresno State, I think the uh, you should be a lot more optimistic for the rest of the season. That was Raphael. Raphael, sorry about yes. that. Uh, we have a question slash joke from Big Boy Twin nine hundred one. He says, "So can USC have the first power air raid offense? Power air raid offense. I mean, they're going to run the ball. Yeah, and they're going to run it with bigger backs at least this year." We'll see, you know, who they end up signing in this class for the running backs. You know, Keenan Kristen is shorter, but he's thick. You know, he's got speed, obviously. Um, so they're going to – it's going to be – they're going to run the ball, and they can run over some guys this year. I don't know if you want to call that power. They're not necessarily running the power concepts. Yeah. They're going to run spread concepts. They're not doing concepts. Like these ISOs and, you know, yeah. just – you know, You're not bringing a fullback <laughs> in. Uh, but 
they could probably run over some people this year. You yeah. know, Marquis Steph's going to run over some guys. I think Stephen Carr can do the same. Vi, you know, those guys are, are capable of doing that. So it's kind of how you want to define it. If you want to define that as as being a power run team, then it could be. Yeah, these big backs are kind of a foreign concept for Mike Jenks, the running backs coach. So uh, we'll see. It could be pretty unique. But they ran the ball almost half the time last year at uh, North Texas, too. So don't don't forget that. Let's see if they can get those one and two, three yards. I think that's the biggest question. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Rather than titling this offense. It's third and two, Agreed. and you can you just hand the ball off yeah. and pick it up. Is, is the offense line going to get a push? Yeah. That's a much bigger question than, than the running backs, I think. Agreed. Uh, Danny on Facebook says, Cody Kessler is in Philadelphia now. Thoughts? Yeah, it's interesting. Um, I went up to speak at the uh, Kern County Trojan Club thing uh, you know, up there in the Bakersfield area. I tried to get Cody to come speak, but that he was at – I think he got – uh, he got signed with Philadelphia like right before that. Uh, I think was he released by Jacksonville maybe, and then got signed or his trade or something. But um, yeah, I mean, I, people say oh USC quarterbacks are busts or whatever in in the NFL. And it's like you got a lot of USC guys that are pulling in paychecks being a quarterback. Now are they superstars in the league or anything? No, but like you're good enough that you can continue to be. If you're holding a clipboard, you're a backup or whatever, but you're still getting still paid to be a quarterback. Paid. It's that's pretty good. I mean, just the percentage, you know, when, when a guy goes into the league, it works out. I mean, they haven't worked out to be like a Tom Brady kind of type. You know, the, the best one we saw was, was Carson Palmer. But to have, you know, Matt Barkley and Cody Kessler, like Cody Kessler especially, for him to be a third-round pick, never expected that for what he was doing. But, you know, been real consistent, and they like him. And uh, he's con continued to get paid to be a, a football player, even though he's not, you know, starting a lot of games. Matt Castle has been in the league for a long time. 14 years now. I mean, where, is he, where is he now? He was with Detroit last year. He made over a million dollars to sit on the bench. <laughs> That's not a bad life, guys. Sign me up. Not a bad <laughs> life. Never played and got drafted. Like, that's still insane. Uh, so we have a question from Mark on YouTube. He says, hi, why are people high on 2022 quarterback Malik Murphy? Watching his highlight video from the 7-on-7 seven -seven camp last week, he didn't look good at all. Bad footwork, inaccurate, and bad throwing motion. Oh, let's, is, let's, is he 2021 or is he 2020? 2022. 2022. Okay. He said 2020. And, I think and that is exactly what you should note. He's going to be a sophomore this year. Yeah. The He's 6'4", and the ball flies out of his hand. He twirls off of his hand. That's what people are excited about. I saw him throw three throws, and I was like, that's a dude. Yeah. Yeah. That's a dude right Also, there. just standing around him, just his, he's a freshman in his body type. You're like, that's a dude. Yeah. He can throw the ball. You know, he's he's not even going to be he's not necessarily going to be the starter this year at Guardian of Sierra. He's gonna he's in a competition with Doug, uh, Doug Brumfield, who's a, a yeah. solid lefty quarterback who has some offers as well uh, from kind of the the mid major of the Power Five, if you want to call him that, the the Kansas the Kansas States. Uh, but it, he's he's going to continue to get better and better, and he's got three years before he's going to sign with someone. Yeah. which to, you know he's going to be really good. You know, sometimes you look at a kid, like, I, I've learned this as I've done this with Gerard and, and, you know, him pointing out body types and, and me saying, well, that guy's really doing well. Well, you know, he doesn't project to the next level necessarily just because you have one good day at a 7-on-7 seven -seven camp doesn't make you a prospect type of thing. Uh, whereas, you know, sometimes when you have one bad day at a, at a camp or, a, you know, a 7-on-7 seven -seven event, it's not the end of the world. Yeah. Because especially if you get the right tutelage, you know, you can change a lot of things. It's like, you know, you look at – a, a baseball team, you, you see a guy that goes from, you know, I've seen this time and time again, a guy that barely pitches to suddenly he's a second-round pick. And you're like, what? how the hell did that happen? It happened a, a couple years ago with a Cal Poly pitcher. He, he had thrown like 14 innings, and then suddenly he was a second-round pick the next year wow. because he fixed a couple of mechanical things and he worked on a new pitch, and suddenly things are so much different. With a quarterback, it's getting a game experience. That's going to be a big thing. And then just having the right qu quarterback coach to kind of point out, okay, hey, you got you to turn your hips here. You got to move your feet. You know, do the small things. And when you still have three years, you, you look at the body type, you look at the arm strength, and you go, he can be molded into a player. That's yeah. why people are excited about uh, a guy like Malik Murphy. Yeah, there's like, similarities to maybe like Troy Williams back in the day. If you remember, he was at, was he Narbonne? I think it was Narbonne. Narbonne. And uh, when Steve Sarkeesian was the coach at Washington, offered him there, and then USC offered him. He ended up going to Washington, transferring to Utah and stuff. But just big kid. As a freshman, he wasn't starting, but he was, like, playing some. And you could just see the intangibles there. And, uh, you know, I think there's a very similar thing with uh, Malik. So 
Mark, don't be too tough on him. Like it's a, you know, he's a, he's a young kid. Just yeah, and, keep and, watching him. And I filmed and edited, edited those highlights, and you kind of see him warm up throughout the day. You know, he was kind of sleepy a little bit in the beginning of the tournament. I had kind of heard that he, you know, the seven on seven USC passing tournament is not the most serious event in the world, and he kind of didn't take it as seriously in the beginning. So he kind of warmed up and, and got better as the day progressed. So I wouldn't read too much into his performance in that one tape. Um, and with these kids, you never know if they. You know, some of these kids will be like, I just got back from Ohio State. Like, so, some of the kids you'll you see at a camp, you'll be like, yeah, he looks a little sluggish, especially for early morning camps. And then they're like, oh, someone will be like, yeah, he just he just flew in from Ohio State and he, he came straight from the airport to the camp. And you go, yeah. oh, okay, I'll forgive that sluggishness. <laughs> I'm not saying that's what happened with Malik Murphy necessarily. But, yeah. you know, these kids, especially during this time of year, they like, you know, in the summer when they have an opportunity. And a kid like him who's already got offers from Ohio State and, and Georgia and some other big-name programs, he might have already been on a visit. Who knows? You know, yeah. Okay. You, know, yeah. you never know what what has someone has coming into the the, the camp that you're at. Mm -hmm. We have a Periscope one real quick. Go for uh, it, Ryan. Tyler Hawkins underscore 58. Who are the ineligible players from the 19 class? Uh, read, read the war read room. The war room <laughs> well, you can do some uh, process of elimination. Who's who's the one that's not here that's that's coming? That we Dorian know? Hewitt, the yes, safety Dorian from Hewitt. Texas, will be here at a later date. Uh, we'll have more on that in the war room. Oh, nice. And if you're a stranger to uscfootball.com, the War Room is something that we post 7 a.m. every Friday. It has all the, the nitty-gritty details, the good stuff uh, about USC recruiting, uh, the program, stuff. insider stuff. It's good stuff. It comes with your subscription to uscfootball.com. So check it out. Good stuff. Yeah. Maybe you'll have more informed questions. You know, you never know. You you know more about USC when you read the War yeah. Room. <laughs> uh, but let's go to a Facebook question from Anthony. He says, how many wins does Helton need to keep his job? I can already envision the excuses. The schedule was really tough. Injuries hit us hard. First year with a new offensive coordinator. We're really young. We're headed in the right direction. I'm just so proud of hard, how hard these young men played, et cetera, et cetera. I don't think those excuses are going to come into play, to be honest. I think it's going to be – it's like brass tacks now. Um, but we don't know. Five and seven last year, you thought that wasn't going to be enough, and it was. Um, I kind of think it's more about – accomplishments like winning the Pac-12 South is like a bare minimum. So with outside of winning the Pac-12 South, I think there's a realistic chance that there's going to be a coaching change. The thing is, you don't, but know, you don't know yeah, because yeah. you got multiple wild cards. One is Lin Swan. Yeah. Every time we thought he should do something, he has not done that. And then the other is you have a new president. We don't know exactly what her process is going to be with the, the program. I, I think it's going to be kind of a wait-and-see process throughout the season, but partly throughout the season because with Carol Folt coming in, it's going to be throughout the semester. Yeah. And how, you know, what is she going to attack first? Uh, you know, there's a lot of issues at USC right now that have to be attacked by a new president. Which one do you go first with? I mean, you can go to athletics. Athletics is – a quicker fix, but in the long, in the grand scheme, it's not as important as some of the other things. So you know, it just depends on what she prioritizes to uh, kind of attack first in, in her in her you know way of trying to improve USC. Yeah, she's got a lot of fires to put out, and if you know, if the, if something happened in the athletics department, it would probably be because she would come in and say, "This is low hanging fruit. There's an unpopular athletic director." And I could make a change there. There's real reasons to make a change because three of his employees were arrested by the FBI and things like that besides the other stuff. So, I mean, it's not like you're doing this out of – I mean, there's real reasons that you would want to do this. Plus, he doesn't have any experience being an athletic director. She does that, and maybe she wins over the favor of a lot of the, like, the diehard USC people. I think if she makes a change, that's probably a big – reason why but there's other you know way bigger things going on around usc that she'd have to deal with too does she tackle those most important things or does she you know get some low-hanging fruit first it's hard to say she might go in and do it all we we just don't know we should know in a couple weeks when Which she uh, crazy. comes up well, actually like a week and a half or something right July wow first it's yeah. coming down the corner fast Ooh. Uh, we have a youtube question from no we don't uh sorry <laughs> <laughs> it didn't load uh it's from Dallas Schwartz, and he, it's specifically for Shotgun. He says, who is USC trying to get as a center? All the talk is about guard or tackle. The thing is you have three centers on yeah. the roster right now, and they're all underclassmen. Um, so you're, just, you're not going to go out and you know, try to – unless there's somebody like Justin Deed really stood out as a, as a center prospect. 
USC is looking at Drake Metcalf. He can move to center. You're looking at Miles Murrow. He He's been too. talked about moving to center. Jonah Monheim is an interior guy probably too. You know, you might look at him at center. Just because you're recruiting guards doesn't mean you're not looking at them to play center as well. I mean, you saw Jordan Austin was the you know the emergency center uh, last year as well. So he took some snaps there, even though he was a guard and played some tackle at USC. You're looking for versatile guys to begin with. But the fact that guys like Miles Miro and, and Drake Metcalf have both done some snapping work is, is a big bonus. And, you know, Miles Miro, uh, if you read the warm room I don't know, probably three months ago now, you know, Tim Drevno told him, he's like, hey, we're looking at you as a center. Yeah. So that's a little insider information for you all if you haven't been paying attention. But, yeah, you know, they've looked at him as that, and that's a position he – one of the reasons why he likes USC is the potential where he could come in and play early at a center position. Yeah. Interesting we got a center recruiting question. Like, Very specific. I like yeah. it. Good question. Uh, Danny on Facebook says, are you hearing about no salute to Troy this year? Actually, the opposite, Danny. Take it away, Ryan. Yeah. Um, so I was at the Trojan Football Alumni uh, Golf Classic on Friday. And if you've been to any of Clay Helton's speaking tours, he's mentioned this too. So looks like salute to Troy is going to be changed a little bit, but it'll be August 17th is what Clay Helton was saying. Um, at the Coliseum, you could go in and check everything out, all the new renovations, see where your seats are and all that stuff. They haven't announced all the details yet, but that's likely what's going to happen. Will they do some sort of like barbecue like they were doing before? It's, it's just hard to say. We don't know all the details yet, but it's going to be something moved over to the Coliseum. I would love to see them do something there where it's more of like a showcase sort of thing, like what we saw in the spring, but it's in the Coliseum. And then maybe still doing uh, the kind of uh, cookout that they were doing it was more of an intimate thing when you're doing it on Cromwell Field and you could sit at a table with one of the football players and things like that. So we'll see. But I think it's, I think it's evolving. And uh, they, they haven't been able to do the, the last couple of spring games in the Coliseum. So I think they wanted to do something now that it's available. Plus, you get in there a week before the Rams preseason game. So you'd rather have some sort of official USC event in the new Coliseum before... Uh, the Rams do their preseason game because the Rams preseason game will be the following weekend of Salute Detroit, and then the following weekend of that is the opener against Fresno State. There you go. There's your yeah. Salute Detroit update. There's your Salute Detroit update. There will be one. Uh, we actually had it. I'm going to deviate a little bit. There was a discussion in the YouTube comments about whether or not USC's youth next season will either hurt them or help them. What do you guys think? Uh... I mean, I think it depends on which position you're talking about, right? Like, when has youth ever helped a college football team? When you get like a stud that's like a know, Dory like or Juju, Ra- yeah, like that. yeah, that's Brown. one player. That's not a the youth of the team. You say, well, oh, is there do star players help a, a program? Yeah, sure. Well, where okay, where would you guys say the youth would help? Like, where's the, you're going to see the most youth on this team? Like, would it be in the secondary? Yeah. So, because I mean, even if they, those guys, there's some older players on, in that group, but they're still all inexperienced. Yeah. I think youth works if you frame it as an influx of new faces when you have a group that's kind of lacking depth, or you kind of. S- run those same guys over and over and they don't really work. You know, maybe fresh faces in the O-line. You know, I could see Drew Richmond, but he doesn't really count as a youth, so I'm not sure I agree with yeah. youth then. I mean, definitely in the secondary, but, you know, if at, you're just worried about some of the injuries and stuff, but you could still have some experience there, maybe some sophomores and stuff in the secondary, but there's a lot of... It, the, the two deep is going to be full of, like, freshmen and stuff when you're looking at it. So I, I think there's a concern there. But just up and down the offense, it's pretty much the same as what we saw last year. you got to change a couple guys out in the offensive line. But a lot of those dudes are back. Uh, 60%. Of the offensive line. Yeah. But I'm saying, just like. a couple guys. 60% but, of the time. Whatever. Line. Like, they, they performed poorly last year anyway. Like, like what are you going to do? I think you're talking about, you know, if the quarterback goes, running backs. Wide receivers. I mean, I think your all your skill guys are are coming back. It's it's going to look pretty much the same. So, um, yeah, I I don't know. I wouldn't agree with like youth movement or anything. But there's you know there'll be some young guys. And JJ Daniels is a freaking you know true sophomore, right? So, but he's you know they played like you start like 10, 11 games, twelve games, whatever. Like you're you're not a freshman anymore. You're not young anymore. I think there'll be an influx at the receiver position too. I mean, yeah. we're, we kind of pass over it because you got the older guys there that are established, but. You know, we'll see if you know if they rotate as many receivers as they want to in yeah. that offense and they want to go with the tempo they want to, you're going to see Drake London out there. You're going to see Munir McClain potentially getting some time. Uh, you know, Kyle Ford, if he's healthy. Me. Brew McCoy, if he's eligible. You know, those guys are going to be on the field uh, if you're rotating as much as they, you know, they purport to want to. Yeah. I think it, talent 
has to be better, greater than the inexperience. If they're inexperienced and have not as much talent, then it's a no for the youth. Does that make sense? Sure. <laughs> we'll give it to you. Sure. Uh, let's go to OJ Mo on Facebook. He says, do you think injuries will mount up as the season goes on? I feel like that's USC's Achilles heel from having a great season. Achilles. I say Achilles. My bad. Achilles heel. It's my heel. Yeah. <laughs> uh, poor, well, we already got one. Clay Helton uh, injured his Achilles. but uh, True. He was in a walking boot, but he stuck through with the golf. He hit a few shots at the golf tournament. So, oh, Lin's well, one was there. Yeah, he was in. He was in a golf cart the entire time last week. He wa He walked out of uh, of yesterday's PRP uh, or the workout before the PRP. So that's a positive sign. He's, he's going the right. Yeah, I asked him like last week, and he was like, "Yeah, it's late Achilles." And he said, "I think he said the same thing." Uh, there. I mean, injuries are part of football. Like you're not going to avoid injuries. You have a different strength and conditioning coach. You have a different philosophy. Maybe you're not going to see as many hamstrings, or maybe there's more ankles. Like who knows? Like it's just hard to say. Sometimes you get this wave of, of different injuries. But I mean, that's a reason you have a hundred guys on your team. Like there's going to be some injuries. I don't think you can go into a season going, you know, geez. I mean, we'll be great as long as no one gets injured all season. Like that's just not realistic. You know, there's there, usually there's positions where you can afford to have some injuries because there's better depth. And there's other positions where it would be, you know, it would be devastating, and that I think that's the case this year too. Yeah. Same, same kind of as always. You, you yeah. don't really know about injuries uh, until it progresses. USC seems to have been bit by the injury bug the last couple of years. At times, having over 20 players missing practice, yeah. you you think some of that might be a little toughness too. So you know, the new is strength that, coach is maybe, that better now? Right, you know, yeah. Hashtag strength training. <laughs> you didn't seem so sure about it this time, Ryan. <laughs> I, I wanted to make sure I got it right. Yeah. Uh, Brave Bull on YouTube says, will we ever see the Stephen Carr we saw in his freshman year? Sure hope so. I mean, the same guy. Check his DNA. Same dude. <laughs> <laughs> You've been checking his DNA? <laughs> I just, they've in, inserted someone into play, in his place. He this did a 23 and me. And, uh, you know, <laughs> this yeah. is now a sci-fi <laughs> <Yeah>. show. <laughs> They want to clone him, you know, because he's so fast. So it's like uh, you want to <laughs> see you. You always want to see players perform to their best abilities. Uh, so Stephen Carr, you want to see him back to that. You know, we, we, you don't know until you put the pads on and see if he runs away from a guy, if he has the burst. That's what's been missing. It's not the jukes are there. You know, he can you know make guys miss in, in the short area. But he doesn't have the same burst to explode out of it and kind of run away from players like he was doing his freshman year. Uh, so he's such a dynamic weapon because he can catch the ball in the backfield. That's a guy that if USC does get the freshman Stephen Carr, now that he's two years older and wiser, you know now maybe he's learned what what his body can do. You know what he what he can do to you know assist his body, I guess. Uh, then you know he can be a dynamic weapon in this yeah. offense because you can split him out. You can do different things with him. Mike Jinks talked about how you can use him as a mismatch uh, potentially. You know, he he's just a unique player that you hope that he can play, be healthy so he can live up to that five star status. Yeah, when I think of Stephen Carr, I think of the gif of like Michael Jackson sitting there eating popcorn. Like I'm just I'm just gonna watch. I'm like I don't know. Like is he gonna be the same? Is he gonna be like? The most dynamic player catching, you know, 50 balls and running for a thousand yards, or is he going to just be a guy? Like, I'm just going to watch. I don't know. I don't know what to say, but uh, I, I kind of think he see. can be. Yeah, it's just one of those wait and see things. Do you think that's something we can tell initially in fall camp, or do we have to wait till game speed if that's going to take over? Game Which, speed. Yeah, it was just hard to see much of anything in the spring for run game stuff at all. True. So good point. Uh, I don't know if we'll see that in the fall. We Maybe saw Marquis Step get a lot of touches and look pretty good. Yeah. True. True, very true. Uh, John Laub, whose question I got in this week, sorry about last week, he says, I live in Utah and I hate BYU with every fiber of my being. Wow. I hate them so much that if they beat SC this year, then I will move out of my state. My question is, where will this I be is... living this winter? Dun, dun, dun. Good question. Uh, Zach Wilson is an absolute stud, the sophomore uh, quarterback uh, for BYU. He was in the bowl game. They beat Western Michigan uh, 18 of 18 for like – 370 yards and four touchdowns. Like, he was freaking perfect in the game. Uh, once he, he got the start halfway through, they beat number six Wisconsin on the road last year. Uh, they're playing a, a really tough early schedule, but they got a lot of home games. They play, listen, get this. So BYU plays USC, Utah, and Washington all at home in their first month, and then they play on the road at Tennessee. So that's a pretty tough early part of the schedule. And if you want to say which team does BYU have the best chance to win, 
I put a poll up there on, on uh, Twitter a, a couple weeks ago or a week or so ago about that. And it was either Tennessee on the road or USC at home. Like, that's where, you know, you look at the, the records of those teams last year. Utah won the South. Washington won the whole Pac-12. Um, those are going to be tough games. And it's hard. BYU to have a hard time with uh, Utah. It's a, a huge rivalry, and they're starting the season that way. So I think BYU might have this one circled as their best chance to win a game. So they got a really good sophomore quarterback, like I said. USC has to be ready, or you might have a new residence come uh, next winter. They, they're going to go to Tennessee and win. So you think they're going to Tennessee yeah, and win? I think so. Wow. You know that Jeremy Pruitt guy? Don't tell my wife. She's going to be really Jane? upset. With that. She should be watching this. That's just a long way to go. <laughs> that, that's a long way to go, and uh, and to win in Knoxville is not. I think know. USC will win it in Provo. And I just bought my flight there, so I'm looking forward to seeing you know right. being in Provo Thanks and for seeing that BYU info, for the first time. And my question is. Why even live in Utah in the winter? Come to California. That's you that's might be a big skier. You True. Know? Never mind. I'm just a SoCal don't, bias. There's traffic enough. Don't invite more people. Actually, <laughs> stay there, John. Stay there. Move, uh, to, move to Sherman Oaks. <laughs> sure, like Uh <laughs> Kelly X Rowe says one question. Uh, when you mention Brew McCoy possibly being able to redshirt or whatnot, what four games would you use Brew McCoy in? I don't. It's not going to be eligible. Yeah, so you have to be eligible. Like if you're not <laughs> eligible, you games. can't just use the four games. If you're, uh, but, if you're picking four games that you you know you got a red shirt a guy, which four games would you pick? Is that, let's that's a let's better, just go with that's that. That's a better question. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I think it depends on the dude. It depends on what you need. It could be, you know. Depth, yeah. Yeah, it could be, oh, there's a bunch of injuries early in the season, so you need it. Like, maybe Kyle Ford can't come until, like, half the way through the season, so you use Brew McCoy early. But a guy like Brew McCoy, you don't really want to. I mean, he's probably going to be gone in three years anyway, so you don't need you know, kind of redshirt him. But it, I think it's different for each player, each situation, what's going on with the team. Uh, I love the rule because it does give you a lot of flexibility. And if you do get a rash of injuries at a certain position and there was a guy that was slated to be redshirted and you can play him at the end of the year and help out, that, that's great. So we had this question on the, the Family Feud podcast, I think a couple weeks ago. But USC, you know, there was no set order of when they would use guys that they were playing the red shirt, when they would use those four games. Usually it was guys played their way into it, you know, in practice. So you saw guys like Abdul Malik McClain. You saw Elijah Winston. Those guys earned opportunities late in the season. And so Elijah Winston was a third down pass rush specialist for a couple games. Yeah. Uh, you know, then you had injuries cause some other ones. Chase Williams, Jordan McMillan getting in there. Those type of guys would not have been playing early in the season, but they had to because of the injuries. Palier Naitiote, that was part of the reason why he got in the Washington State game. Uh, you know, it kind of worked his way. He didn't redshirt, but, you know, if, you know, he was in there for an injury as well. Yeah. So there was no set pattern. USC, you know, some other programs had a set pattern where they were waiting until the last games or they wanted to wait for the blowouts, you know, so they get the freshmen and they get more playing time. So it's it's difficult. It's a new thing. So a lot of coaches are trying to figure it out on their own. So I think we're still in the learning phase uh, of what both Clay Helton and other coaches around the country are going to do with those four games. If you know, all right, we want a red shirt, you know, uh, Keenan Kristen, you know, we got three running backs in front of him. You know, we got four guys over there that we're, you know, confident with, with Ben Easington and some of those uh, walk-ons as well. Well, we want to still use him and get an opportunity. So let's throw him out there. When do you throw him out there, though? Do you want yeah. to try him early in the season? No and, and then suddenly he goes, he goes for, you know, two 70-yard runs. You go, well, we can't sit him now. <laughs> we got to use this guy more. He's got that speed. Yeah. That's, the, that's the element we don't have. You know, that, that's the hard part, and that's the part we, we're, the coaches are still, you know, they're still learning and, and trying to figure out as well. It's part of the strategy. I mean, you might say, hey, we're going to unveil this dude against Notre Dame and, like, <laughs> throw a swing pass to him, and he blows by everybody and scores a touchdown. And you're like, it was kind of a secret weapon thing, you know. And, you could, and then you're going to get criticized for not using him before. But no one's done that yet. You know no. that's coming. Someone is going to yeah. be like, if someone's going to explode for a 200-yard yeah. game or something, people are like, where did this guy come from? Well, we were actually saving him for this game. We knew we were going to have to redshirt him. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, so there's there's a lot of different, you know, strategies Strategy, you could yes. use, you know. Uh, and that's going to be up to the coaches. to They, they have to come up with it. Uh, Makulu on Facebook says, who are we looking at as far as kick returner and punt returner? Tyler Vaughn's question mark? I think you'll see the same guys right right at this moment. You got Valus Jones back, right? Valus is back. Steven Big Carr is nice. back. Uh, Tyler Vaughn is back. You know, the special teams coordinator is still the same. So I don't think you'll see a bunch of changes there. Now, you may see some young guys sure. get into the mix. You know, Amon Ross St. Brown was a backup at the punt returner position. 
you know, if there's an injury, he could be the guy to go in. Keenan Kristen with the speed he has, you know, you, you think he might be a threat as, as a returner, but it's hard for me to see anyone just getting supplanted by a young about guy. Ote, like the, um, I haven't seen him return any yeah, kicks. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, he's fast. I know he's a yeah. – I think he did some punt returning in high school. I don't know if okay. he was a kick and punt returner or not. Uh, Kevin Randolph on YouTube says, most intriguing position change and, posi- and any position change predictions. I mean, Liam Jimmins yeah, that was looks weird. like an offensive lineman. Yeah. He's bigger. Yeah. He's getting thicker. He's changed his body a little bit. The fact that he was able to jump in there, and if you, you go and look at some of our premium content, you know, Chris Trevino, Keely and I talked him into to actually charting all the offensive and defensive line one-on-ones. And you know, Chris looked at it, and when he put out the results, one of the things that was interesting was Liam Jimmins struggled early. Uh, which you would expect from a defensive lineman moving to offensive line, but he got re- he got much better as the the spring progressed, and it makes you wonder if if he can continue to take those big strides. He was a guy that that made some big strides on the defensive line to get in and earn some playing time uh, last year, and he was he was you if I remember correctly he was USC's most efficient pass rusher, meaning he got pressures more often than any other um, any other player per you know per snap uh, attempt, basically. Interesting. So, you know, he's a guy that worked his way into that mix. He's a three-star guy. You know, he's the forgotten guy on that group. He gets switched over now. You go, oh, he's, he's a three-star guy. He's going to be forgotten about again. He's a guy that might surprise people and, and, you know, suddenly get some playing time because of an injury or something. He's just – I'm not going to put it past him because of how far he's gone in the little time he's been at offensive tackle already. Yeah, I'd say the, it was Palier, you know, T.O.T. and uh, John Houston kind of switching positions. True. It was yeah, a little, that. you know, we've seen it in the spring, but it's just like, oh, that's kind of interesting. Um, I don't know, what, did you guys predict any? Or do you have any other thoughts on those? Matt picked the tight end, or what's going on? <laughs> no, we, yeah, we've gotten a podcast question about that. Yeah. But no, I don't think so. I don't know if there's going to be any more. I mean, there, there could be, but um, there was a few. <sighs> but the Jimmins think. one was the big, that was the, the kind of big. And then for him to... You know, be you know, starting that what for the spring showcase, right? He was yeah. he was in there, so well injuries too, but yeah, yes, but, but he he hung in there. And the interesting thing too is that he had talked to Clay Helton about switching a season prior, but uh, Kanichi Udesi kind of kept on to Liam and didn't want him to leave. So the fact that he could have been there earlier, one you makes you wonder like what could he be now if that yeah, happened? If it interesting. Really. Okay. Uh, Raphael on Facebook says, "Would USC run more four wide since the return of Valus Jones? And what's up with Pai Young? Is he transferring or staying?" We didn't really get to see how they're going to use the receivers to a full effect because they were so they were so limited. Yeah. Uh, there, but there weren't a ton of four wide receiver sets in the in the spring. How much will that change in the fall? And you know, there's how much be is some because the, there wasn't four wide receivers. Yeah, all the that, time. you yeah. don't really know. <laughs> uh, you know, you had f- five scholarship guys, I think it was. So you weren't using everybody because you, you were trying to use tempo. You're trying to set that up. When you get a full complement of receivers in the fall, that's when we'll find out. Uh, you know, I don't think we've seen anything that necessarily tells us that definitely are going to do four and five wide receivers. You know, they still have multiple tight ends on on the roster, so right. it, it's not like you're just going to excommunicate those guys. Yeah. Uh, while we're on the topic of position changes, I'm going to answer a recent question. AKA Boone three two one says, "Who is the LB that moved to safety, and will he stay there for the foreseeable future?" That was Raymond Scott, and yeah. it's TBD right now. He's still, yeah. And the last time we saw him, he was yep. at safety. Mm-hmm. Um, that's cool. And he, when he's playing more nickel, the nickel safety spot than, <laughs> than a true safety spot. Yeah. Adela Schwartz has another question for you, Shotgun. He says, with Drevno as the O-line coach for the spring and fall, will USC have a running back get over 1,500-plus yards? Yes, or is the new offense going to be too big of no. a hindrance? No. no. And it's not that the new offense is going to be too much of a hindrance. It's you've got three guys that are yeah. going to spread it out. Uh, you, you just, It'll USC, be more of a committee, I think. Yeah, you know? USD doesn't have the bell cow guy that they're just going to give – you know, 30 carries to a game. I just, right. it's, it would be very difficult. And the fact that every running back gets hurt would make me it, – it, I would have a hard time making that prediction. Yeah. 1,200, 1,000 to 1,200, I could see that. Yeah. Uh, with this group, 1,500 seems a little too much. Yeah. Alejandro on Facebook says, are you guys excited about the new press box? I haven't really thought about it yeah, too much. Um, it should be interesting. Uh, I mean – I, I didn't like, mind the last ones because they weren't as far to go up. You know, when I run the steps at, at, after a game or before a game, you grab side. some food before heading back down the sidelines. But we'll have these marble staircases now and fancy. stuff. It's going to be fancy. So fancy. Uh, bougie. Keeping uh, on the topic, sorry, I'm changing subjects now. Keeping on the topic good. of uh, Coliseum, 
Bobby Walden says, any news on ticket sales? I'm wondering if the recent momentum has improved sales. Uh, I, I mean, I think that's possible. Um, we haven't really heard that yet. Uh, I don't think we're going to know a lot until like we see the first game. Um, we're not getting a whole lot of, of data out there. When you talk to people, they're like, oh, you know, it's, it's, it's doing all right. And uh, I think they expected some, some downturn. Um, I think there was maybe more downturn than they were uh, really anticipating. I know a lot of people are upset because their seats are moving and all this kind of stuff. So we're going to have to watch the first couple games and see, you know, how the dust settles. But Fresno State might bring 15,000, 20,000 people themselves. So that might skew things a little bit. And that's going to depend on how the team does, you know, and, and so we'll see. But no real data on how the, the ticket sales and stuff are going. I don't know anything about tickets. Yeah. That's a, that's <laughs> you look like you're going to say something. That's a Dan Weber question. Yeah. We, we try to find out stuff. They're not really being, you know. It's a little coy. They're, they're, still, they're still working on that. There's still people will email us stuff, the offers that they're getting, uh, upgrading to this, you know, trying to move to that. So there's, but there's opportunities. If you were in, uh, if you wanted to get better seats uh, and you were on a waiting list or things like that, like there's opportunities now because a lot of those people in the better seats didn't really get to be where they wanted to go, so they they cancel their tickets, and then you could move up to where they were. So there's there's opportunities if you know, if you want. This is kind of like a buy low sort of situation for a lot of people. So some people are kind of taking advantage of that too. True. AKA on YouTube says the 2020 West O line class is considered weak. Is 2021 significantly better? Just kind of better, or in the same caliber? I think it's it's hard to tell because offensive linemen are like the last. Like yeah. quarterbacks are identified when they're eighth and ninth graders. Offensive linemen oftentimes are identified later in the in the process yeah. than, than others. So it, it's hard for me to say. I mean, I like the the core group of of M and M's that that USC is going after with Miles Miro and Drake Metcalf and, and Jonah Monheim locally. Um, you know, they're going outside the state to look for you know for other tackles and you know those six foot six to six foot eight guys. A lot of offers in Colorado and Arizona and Joey Wright being committed from Nevada. So it, it's hard to say though. The local class I think will be a little bit better because it, it's a pretty steep drop off from that that top tier of guys yeah. um, to you know the the three or four. I mean the three star guys. You know I, I think those top tier guys are, are far and away better. Because I just don't think there's a ton of talent. You know, the the, the offensive line, defensive line, one on ones, at both the Los Angeles camp and the Oakland camp were just you know, pretty thin. You know, yeah. there weren't there wasn't a ton of talent as there as much talent as there has been in the back yeah. past years. We're uh, top of the hour, so we should probably go into. Uh, yeah, I was about to. That was my next fire. thing. Rapid oh, nice. fire. Uh, Mark on Facebook says, "How's Clay's, Clay's leg? Is he recovering?" I think we talked about it at the top of the show. He has a slight uh, Achilles tear. He's going to wait to get surgery until after the season. Uh, he's in a boot, kind of yeah. making progress. He, he said he took a couple swings at the golf tournament when I asked him. So yeah, he did a couple things. Andrew on Facebook says, "Do you think all of these night games are going to affect the team's play?" Didn't no. specify who the which team. No, they're used to it. There's nothing. Uh, yeah. Uh, David Gold says, any truth to Urban Meyer coaching SC if Clay doesn't make the cut? No. I mean, I mean that's <laughs> so far. We get this every week. Yeah, like, <laughs> you don't know. Like, he, it's, it's a long way away. But Zach Smith, the uh, who's been arrested how many oh, times God. recently, yeah. says that he's seen or he knows the mailman that USC sending direct yeah, That's direct trying to get to people to listen to his <laughs> podcast, so. Yeah, we're not even entertaining yeah, that. Yeah, that's just uh, Jasper Smith says, will Hunter Eccles be heavily in the rotation in 2019? I think he has a very good chance to, and he's just got to take that next step of development. He's got to show the maturity and show the consistency. Consistency is a big word with him. He does like the photos, too. He likes to pose for the photos. Sure. And his dad is great. He watches the show yeah. and came to our live event and stuff. So. Hello, hello. Uh, John says, will this year's defense do better against Stanford than last year's? Will this team be as physical as last year's? I saw this question and I didn't understand it. Because <laughs> why was the de the defense was not bad against Stanford no. last year? What was it, 14-3, 17-3? Yeah, it was it was pretty good. If the offense showed were at a pre yeah. any life, then <laughs> uh, at the defense – because if you look at – the previous years, USC beat Stanford, what was it, like 38-24. You know, there's higher scoring games. You think it's going to be the 10-7 to game, but it just had never been. And last year it kind of was, but it was more just because USC's offense looked like trash. It was incompetent, yeah. It's pretty bad. Except when Matt Fink was in. True. It's true. They had a competent drive in that yeah. sequence. JT um, Daniels got hurt that game. Then JT Daniels got pounded on for that entire game because the offensive line was not very good. Yep. 
Uh, Anthony says if SC goes three and three in the first six games, will Clay be fired? Three and three is tough because uh, there's it's a tough stretch. You know, you're not expected to really go on the road and beat Washington or Notre Dame. But if you're losing to a Fresno State or a BYU, I think that's going to set off some alarm bells. Um, you know, but I, I think two and four, you can you know probably uh, probably in a bad spot. But three and three, I'm not really sure. It depends how you lose and who you lose to and things like that. We, we still know. We don't know who's going to – I mean, let's why not even be the athletic director by then. And if, and if he's not, I think there's much more likely of a chance that something happens. It's just but, the wild cards are too – Yeah, there's there's a lot of variables. Is a mid-season firing still on the table? Is it, is it on the it table? Is. Someone someone brought that be. up in the questions. They're like, there's no way they do it. And I'm like, how can you say there's no way when the last – Two have been that. Two coaches. Yeah. Because of that. Because they want to break that pattern. They yeah, don't but, want the, to... but what what happened with, with Lane Kiffin? He should have been fired after the Sun Bowl, right? And he wasn't. So when you're supposed you're supposed to fire a coach and you don't, then the midseason thing is a realistic possibility of the next year. And it happened with you know Tarmac, you know. Clay Helton, a lot of people felt he should have been fired, you know, and he wasn't. So I think that puts the midseason firing back on the table, even though there have been two in a row. And you would rather not do that. But you bring back a coach that everyone thinks should have been fired, and this is where you are. Let's remember that Sarkeesian was fired not for his coaching acumen, but for cause. True. So. Yeah. Does the early signing day and how everything's kind of moved up or early signing period uh, change whether or not USC should fire midseason? I think if you know, you know. Just, you make the yeah. move, you know, and you start, you can start the, you know, process earlier. You can start, you know, identifying the prospects that you like. You know, it's the same thing with, with any position coach, too. Now, position coach, you might hold on to them, but you also would start identifying earlier. Uh, but you just got to make – the sooner you can make a move, especially, you know, if you can make it right at the end of the season instead of lingering for a week or two, because the right. end of the season to the signing day is so quick. Right. It's two weeks, basically. It's accelerated the process, yeah. I think. Yeah. Everything has been accelerated. and It might make it more likely to have a midseason firing – just because, I, I think definitely. Yeah, you have this. Uh, so I. That's why I think it's still on the table, even though you've had two in a row. I mean, I think previously, like if you look 15 years ago, like in season firings, like you had to do something really bad. Right. Yeah. Whereas now it's it's more com commonplace, and it's also the the price value. I mean, the the contract values now. Like when you're paying somebody six million dollars, like all right, we gotta get results now. Right. People don't want to wait around for four or five years for a coach. They want to see yeah. it in year two. And I think if you look at programs across the country, well-run programs that have like great athletic directors and, and just you know great leadership probably don't have a lot of the midseason firings. Poorly run programs, you're going to have more of them. And USC has been pretty poorly run. Yeah. Well, better decisions means less in-season firing. Yes. Or better original decisions, I yes. would say. Uh, Jasper Smith says, which game on the schedule do you think USC will surprisingly win? Washington. Really? Ooh. So another trip to Seattle and win that one. Um Probably not favored against uh, Washington, Notre Dame. I would say Utah might be the most likely. Like maybe that's a like a, a couple point spread that Utah's favored in that they could win that game because they they usually beat Utah at home. It's kind of like whoever's at home. Yeah. Wins. So I'd probably go with Utah if you're going to look at teams that are USC would be an underdog against. I don't think there'd be that many, but Utah would I think would be one of them, and I think that's the most likely chance. Then beating like a Notre Dame or a Washington on the road, Oregon at home, that would be an interesting one too. I think Oregon will be favored in that one too. Washington, all right, that's yeah. that that would be a big spread. So that's a that's a big upset if that happens. Uh, Rich kid wants shotgun to predict who will be the starters in the secondary, and someone on Facebook wanted to know: Do you think uh, Christiel will get a starting corner spot? No. I don't think a freshman's going to jump into that mix. I, I think it'll be Elijah Griffin. My guess is right now it would be Elijah Griffin if he's healthy, takes that next step. Greg Johnson. Uh, I think Chase Williams has, has really locked down that nickel spot. I think he's been pretty solidified there. And then the safety spots, probably Talano and Isaiah Polamau. Yeah. Though C.J. Pollard, you know, it could be a walk. He could work his way into that mix. And maybe even, you know, maybe they even go to a three-safety look, uh, you know, like they previously did with – you know, Chris Hawkins and Leon McQuay kind of rotating along with uh, Marvell Tell or Marvell Tell and was it Marvell Tell and, and Chris Hawkins rotating with Leon McQuay as well. Yeah, it was just tough for Pollard missing the spring. You didn't know. help. Um, with a new, new coach. Yeah. yeah. 
Uh, Sean on Facebook says, will the fast offense make the defense worse or better? Will it make Pendergast rotate more players? We talked about this, I think, on the podcast with Dan, yes. where I think that because the offense is going to be more efficient and because they're going to have – they're going to pick up. It's not going to be like score or punt. It's going to be like pick up some first downs. Maybe you score. Maybe you, you could. But I think you can put the defense in better positions with this offense. So, if you score more points, yeah, I mean you you get to give the other you know the, the opponent more opportunities. But I think the offense is going to be more efficient, move the chains more, and you have a better punter. So I think you could put opposing offenses in worse spots where USC would go three and out, and then they the opposing offense would start midfield. I don't think you're going to see that now. So they might not score, but I think you're going to get a couple first downs and still be able to pin a team deep. Where if you didn't, if you didn't get a first down or two in this offense last year, you couldn't flip the field, and opposing offenses would start near midfield. Yeah. A competent offense will help the defense. Yeah. Yes. Good rapid fire answer, shotgun. I'm Proud trying. of you. Uh, Jasper Smith says, aside from Austin Jackson or J. Tufele, which player can potentially jump out with a monster, monster in all cap season, and challenge for All American status? Michael Pittman Jr. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I, th I think like an Amon Ra could. I think even like a Tyler Vaughns could. Like you, you know. I don't know if you want like jump from, hey, they're not playing as much to suddenly they're all American. But I, yeah. mean, I think that Michael Pittman Jr. can put up the stats. Amon Ra, St. Brown was another guy that I would consider. Uh, but, or Stephen Carr, if he's fully healthy. Yeah. Because I predicted he would win the Heisman this year. He's going to need to. Christian Rector could get a whole bunch, you know, double-digit sacks. You could see Palier, no Dote, like go absolutely ballistic and lead the team in tackles. It's, I mean, it's almost like there's talent on this team. There's a lot of talent, so there's potential what? for upside. Upside. Martin says, do you think the offense will pass 70% and run 30%? No. No. I don't. We've said this every single time. 55 like, and 45? Hey, hey, go was easy, it, what was guys. it, 50? Yeah. This isn't Mike Leach's. This is not What was Mike the number? Leach's. 50, it was 53 and 47 53. or something. Yeah. Like, yeah, that's what they did last year in North Texas. So it was almost a coin flip for which one they would do. Uh, Steve says, you guys touched on the Fresno State game, setting the tone for the season. However, which game this season will define the season, either positively or negatively, or be most memorable, he says. Utah. I think that's the most important game. <laughs> that face from shotgun. You, you're, if you want to win the South, which I think is the goal, you're going to have to beat Utah. So... I don't think it matters if you Let's lose you to Stanford that. as much or go with Notre Dame. Utah will determine the winner of the South. So I think you beat Utah, then you win the South. If you don't, then you don't, and then the season's kind of over. I think the most memorable game will be the UCLA game because regardless of if USC starts out like trash or starts out on world fire, that last game of the season is going to be really big, especially after the way they ran the ball on USC last year. Yeah. I Important. would say you dub. Because okay. that's eyes are going to be on that game, and I think it's depending on how USC plays. It's whether okay they can kind of be looking at Pac-12 champs. How are they doing? Versus if they lose to UW, people are going to be like, okay, now we're kind of set on clinching the South, and we'll see what happens. And they kind of limp into Notre Dame. So yeah, not sure. I think it's important if you beat if you beat Washington, it's huge. Like, yes, it's just like it was in 2016 when they were you know, started one and three. You beat number four or whatever it was, Washington, on the road. That changed the narrative for the entire rest of the season. So I think it's huge upside to win. If you lose, it's just like, ah, oh, you're supposed to go on the road and lose to Washington. Where Utah doesn't matter. Like, you beat Utah, you're probably going to win the South. You lose to them, you're probably not. And, and you're kind of like, okay, well, now what, now what are you playing for? True. Uh, Brian says, do you think they wait to use Kyle Ford for the last four games of the season to retro him and give him some more time to get going? Depends on how healthy he is. Yeah, yeah it's going to depend on his health. And, you know, if he's healthy and dominating like he was as a high schooler, then maybe he comes back sooner. Yeah. SS Joe Mag says, will USC be able to stop the run? Sure. Uh, better than is what we saw good? last year. You're going to have a four-man – you're going to have, like, more, you know, bigger guys up front. I think you're going to do better against the run in general uh, if they if that's the front they end up uh, using. And I think, you know, EA out there, I think he can be a tackling machine. I, yeah, I, I, I think they can – do a better job stopping them. Certainly better than what they did against UCLA. Um, Rich Kid says, who will take the bigger step forward this year, Elijah Griffin or Isaac Taylor Stewart? Elijah Griffin. Yeah, I'd probably Griffin. Like, I'd, like Shotgun, I'd predict him to be a starter, so I'd go Griffin. I just seem to like him more, too. Uh, oh. HR Pick and Stuff says, which wide receiver leads the team in touchdowns? Raw. Yeah, probably Amon Ross St. Brown. Raw, raw. Yeah, I would agree. 
Um, Brian, he'll, he'll catch those ones like kind of in the middle. Like Pittman will catch like touchdowns, but like Amon Ra will catch passes that become touchdowns. But Pittman also breaks tackles and then takes. He it does too. Yeah, he could do it. I mean, it's not like he can't do that, but I just <laughs> I feel like there's more like. Yeah, where he'd have to rely on some physical thing. Like, I'm going to say Brown will, like, find a way. You know, he'll so find the path. No Eric Croman hook? No. Oh. I bet he <laughs> nah. catches one this year, though. He might. Calling it. All right. Cool. That's a very uh, crazy. Bold, bold prediction. The bold prediction thing you're in. That um, that's the joke. Brian says, who wins the center battle? Brett Neal. Yeah. Oh, Brett yeah. Neal on. Um, HR Pick and Stuff says, will Clancy wake up out of his coma and field a top 20 defense this year? I was reading that blind, so. Um, to my knowledge, he's not in a coma. Uh, I think they could make significant strides. Uh, simpler scheme, really deep front seven. We'll see with the, you know, with the secondary. Uh, hard to say, but yeah, I, I think the defense is going to be improved. Still not sold on that secondary yet. Okay. Yeah, I don't know about top 20, but we'll see. AKA says, with the 4 3 base, who will be the starting down lineman? And Putt Rio says, what, D what is the D line looking like this year? And Ivan I actually asked earlier, is Marlon T going to be a force this year or not? I think he will be. You're going to see him and uh, Brandon Peely in the middle. You're going to see uh, Jay Tufele as well. You're going to see Christian Rector. That would probably be your starting four if you just play four down linemen straight and you don't, you know, you can use those outside linebackers and whether they put their hand on the ground, that's going to be a kind of a question mark because yeah. you're going to have Hunter Could Eccles. be a Connor Murphy out there opposite too. I mean, if they only use two tackles kind of thing, yeah. you know. You have Hunter Eccles, you got Abdul Malik McClain coming off the edge, Elijah Winston, those three guys are kind of in the mix there for that. So it's just going to be, we don't know for sure how they're going to kind of mix, mix and match with those until we see a a game to be honest yeah we're, we're still gonna watch practice and try to find out but we still need to see a game before we know for sure ldr wants to uh, t wants to know behind the curtain he says which sc coach will we likely see on tunnel vision da, da, da. Da, da, da. uh we're working on some um yeah so we had we had gavin morris on uh but we're gonna try to get some you know, a lot of the coaches live in the south bay so during the off season before fall camp starts we'll try to get you uh one or two guys on so we're working on that Anthony says, Shotgun, does Marquis Step win the job? No. No. <laughs> uh, Trojan fan says, no How many tackles will our new kicker get? Ooh. He's going to stay away from tackling people. I think, I mean, the punter. The punter, hopefully. I think we're talking about. about yeah. uh, he could tackle some people, but the reason why he quit Aussie Rules football is because of concussions. So I think he's going to tackle some people. <laughs> I think he's going to get out there and tackle some people. He's 27 years old. Like, I'm not out here to just punt. I want to go tackle somebody. Yeah, there, there was something. I don't know if it was even a question, but, but someone said, did you see him punt the Instagram post that he punted? No, yesterday. I need to follow him on Instagram. I, I saw it, and it's it's a good 60 yard. I was trying to count it up. You can't freeze the, the video to count up how many yards it was, but it's kind of ridiculous. Yeah. With, like, 19-second hang time, basically. Yeah. Basically. I think basically. that's what I'm most curious about, is just seeing USC fans react to Ben Griffith's punts. Yeah. I think like, it's, holy it'll, be, it'll be a new experience. Very different than last year. Uh, we have one final question, Let's and it's from it Sean. And he says, for Shotgun, how good will the baseball and basketball team be this year? Any predictions? Uh, I just had a long conversation with Jason Gill, stopped by his office after camp today, and you know, some very positive things there. You know, they're, they're interviewing pitching co coach candidates. Ted Silva was in for an interview today from the Nebraska staff, Darren Erst on it, Darren Erstad's staff. Um, so I, I think that's a very good hire if they eventually make that hire. He's kind of the front runner right now. Gabe Alvarez is sticking around with USC, which I think is a really big addition for USC. I think there's some small things that they can change that will help this program. And there are some really talented arms coming back on that group. Now I was talking with, with Gil and, and Gabe about that. Some really talented arms coming back. And you've got a lot of talent on the basketball court this year, too, with the, the freshman class coming in. It's going to be some young guys on both of those teams. But I think there's some really big upside on, for both programs uh, going into the season. And it's not necessarily a make or break year for baseball, but for basketball, I think it is. You, you got a lot of talent. You got to you got to perform this season. Yeah, no more under 500 for football, basketball, and baseball. That that can't happen again. It's a very bad stat they had last yeah. year. Yeah, true, very true indeed. Alrighty. We did it, guys. Rapid fire. We got through all the questions. Well done. Uh, to answer a question that was asked last week, there was a question about the. What, 150th anniversary patches? Yes, there was. And uh, we found out, Dan and I found out, that the USC will probably not be wearing those. 
they just said, ah, we don't really care about that. Really? Because it doesn't really fit in with their on their jerseys the way they want it to, so they're probably not going to do it. The coaches may do something on their polos or something, but USC is, is going away from that. Ah. Well, they, but USC is all about tradition. Shouldn't you honor yeah. your history? Isn't it the 150th of college football, not USC's? Oh, really? I don't remember the yeah. question. My bad. Then, eh. That's why they're like, eh, we don't want to be like everybody else, because everybody apparently is going to be wearing them. I gotcha. Believe. Interesting. Okay. Well, there you have it. I forgot who asked that, but there's your answer. Alrighty, but that's going to wrap it up for this week's show. We'll be back next week, 6 p.m. Wednesdays. We'll see you then. Thanks for watching. That's Shotgun. That's Ryan. I'm Keely. We'll see y'all next week. See ya.